Hey everybody, I'm Jeanette, a self-professed true crime nerd, and welcome to the Law & Murder Podcast, where we're going to be talking about true crime and exonerations. You ready? Let's get started. Hey guys, sorry for being a day late on episode four. I had to go out of town and where I was, I didn't really have a place to record. So a day late, you have it. I don't plan on making this a theme. I do like consistency and prefer it, but life happens, right? Today in episode four, we're going to talk about the exoneration of Floyd Bledsoe. He was convicted of murdering his wife's sister. And this story kind of takes a weird turn because the police had everything that they needed to convict the person. And then they went ahead and acted shady and totally went for Floyd and he had nothing to do with it. And there was no evidence pointing to him doing it. He didn't even confess, which was the craziest thing. But Let's get started and see what happened. Camille was a good kid. She was 14 years old. She went to school, got good grades, and she was pretty actively involved in her local church. She had moved in with her sister Heidi and her husband Floyd not that long before her murder. And it's because she was not really getting along with her mom. And that living arrangement that she had with um, her sister worked better for everybody. Her family lived pretty close together anyway, and they lived in Oskaloosa, Kansas. So she visited her mom often. On November 5th, 1989, Camille had a normal day on the day she went missing. She got up, ate breakfast, got on the bus, did the school thing. Pretty normal routine for a 14-year-old kid. No one had thought that it would be the last time that they would all see each other. At 4.30 in the afternoon, she gets off the bus, says goodbye to the bus driver, and goes into her home to get ready for a church event that she had that night. After her church retreat, she was supposed to go and stay with her mom for the weekend, and her mom had expected her to be at her house around 10 o'clock at night. So Camille went into her house, dropped off all of her belongings, and got ready to go. A little later in the afternoon, around 5 o'clock, one of her friends, Robin, went to the door to see if she wanted to hang out, but no one answered the door. Not really a big deal, and it wasn't unusual because she went home to see her mom on the weekend, so her friend just thought that she had went there early. The church staff had come to pick her up on the bus for the retreat. They didn't find anybody at home either, but, you know, maybe they thought that she was going to see her mom too. Who knows? Around midnight, her sister Heidi gets home from work thinking that Camille is at her mom's house and she gets a phone call from their mom asking where Camille went. Heidi has no idea where she could be at at midnight. She was pretty punctual. Like I said, she was a good kid. So they got worried and started searching for Camille. She never did make it home that night. After she got off the bus on November 5th, she ran into her sister's husband's brother, Tom. And growing up, he had been known to be intellectually different than other people and seemed to have a history of some weird sexual fantasies, which included little girls. He was also a member of the church that Camille went to. He was an active member of the church's youth group, which was a little strange, but maybe because he was a little intellectually behind, that was okay. It doesn't, I didn't find anything to say any different. Tom was also hard of hearing, and he lip-read people in order to understand what they say to him. So on that afternoon of November 5th, Tom had come upon Camille at an intersection where he had asked her if she wanted a ride. Since that was family, she'd gotten in the car for a ride, but she wasn't taken to church. Tom tried to have sex with Camille in the car, and she laughed at the idea that Tom would have even considered that. Tom got angry with her for making him look like a fool, so he took her out back in a big field that people used to hunt game on, and it was really quiet for obvious reasons, and a pretty good place to commit a crime where no one can see you. He holds the gun to Camille to get her to comply and gets her into the woods where he sexually assaults her. Based off of a colonel's witness testimony, he hears a girl screaming early in the afternoon, and he heard some gunshots. Camille had been running away, screaming for help, but instead Tom had shot her four times. After she had been killed, Tom and his father, also named Floyd, dragged her into the woods and buried her and piled a heap of trash on top of her behind Tom and his father's home. They'd walk away and resume life as if nothing ever happened. Floyd had gotten home a couple minutes after Heidi did, 
and Heidi had told Floyd that Camille never came home and she never went to her mom's house. They got really worried and started calling around and no one has seen or heard from Camille and no one would ever hear from her again. Her family would go to the police station. Her family would go to the police station to file a police report, but the police were unconcerned because running away or being gone past curfew was normal teenage behavior. To her family, though, they knew something was wrong because this was totally out of character for Camille. Because the police department didn't help her family, her family went ahead and started a search party the very night that they realized that she was missing. The next day, because the town had started searching for Camille, the police went in on the investigation too. They brought dogs. Unfortunately, they didn't have any luck, but the police were in on the investigation and the entire town was out there trying to find Camille. After two days, they hadn't found anything. On Sunday, November 7th, 1999, the pastor of the church that Camille went to continued with his Sunday service, and before he finished, he had asked the congregation if they had knew anything about Camille. Floyd's brother Tom was in the congregation, and according to the pastor, he seemed to be behaving strangely, but he didn't really think anything of it, but he did notice it. Once the sermon was over, he went home and found that he had a message on his answering machine. It was Tom. It turned out that after the sermon, he felt super guilty and went to the police station and was sitting in the parking lot and made three phone calls. The first phone call was to the pastor. The message reads as follow, and I quote, Hi, Jim. This is Tom. I wanted you to be the first to know. I know I lied to you. I know where Camille is, and when you get this message, I'm going to turn myself into the police. I wish I never did it. I hurt the church. I hurt God. Most of all, I let everyone down. All I can say is, I'm sorry. I'll pay for the rest of my life for what I've done. All I can ask is for the church to remain strong. Please forgive me. As a favor, please remember my mom and dad. Help them when they go through. Help them with the pain. I'm about to. Thank you, Jim. End quote. After that phone call, he called his parents and had told them what he had done, and his parents told him not to go in and confess until he had a lawyer present. His parents had arranged for his attorney, Michael Hayes. After that phone call, he called the pastor again, leaving another message saying, I quote, Please help mom and dad through this. Right now, they're disappointed. I know that the church will be too. All I can ask is, Forgive me for what I've done, and I will pay for the rest of my life. I wish I could turn the clock back, but I can't. I made my choice. And he hung up. Meanwhile, not knowing any of this information, the family was still worried about Camille and frustrated that the police hadn't done anything, and they continued to search. But that day, on November 7, 1999, Tom did in fact go into the police station and confess to killing Camille. The search then ceased, and Tom's parents had brought in Mr. Hayes, the lawyer, and when the police questioned Tom, he told the police that he killed her with his gun and where she had been shot. The lawyer had led the police to where the body was, but didn't show the police exactly where it was, so they had to search. The police found a pile of rubble that looked out of place and decided that that's where they would search. They found Camille at the bottom of that pile, with trash all over her and four gunshot wounds exactly as Tom had described in his confession to the police. One in the arm, two in the torso, and one in the back of the head. Tom had also given the police the gun that he used, but it had been cleaned so no fingerprints or blood would be found on the murder weapon. Floyd had friends in the police department, and the day that Tom had confessed, the police would call Camille's family to the station. They were super hopeful that the police had found Camille alive and well and that she had just run away for a little bit but her sister Heidi had already known what they were going to say as soon as she walked in the door. Camille had been found, but she was no longer with us. She had been murdered. And worst of all, it was Tom who had killed Camille. Her family was absolutely devastated. Meanwhile, in jail, Tom's lawyer, Mr. Hayes, was a pretty corrupt guy, and he had a background with the police department and was owed a favor. He had helped the police department with some money issues that they had, and it was the police department's time to pay back the favor. And the way that they would do that was to frame Floyd 
for the murder of Camille and get Tom out of jail. So they hatched a plan. Tom's dad had provided an alibi for Tom to go against the defense. He stated that they had went to an auction together from 1 to 10 p.m. where he fell asleep as soon as he got home. When Tom got to jail, Tom thought, mm, this isn't for me, so I'm going to get out. Hey, guard, listen, my brother was the one that actually did it. He was the one that committed the murder of Camille. I'm a weird person with fetishes, and my brother told me that he would tell that I had sex with a dog, like little girls, and watched porn all the time, so I confessed to murdering Camille because I was scared. On November 12, 1999, Tom was given a polygraph test where he was asked if he had killed Camille. He said no. After the testing, he had confessed to the murders, but his lawyer talked to Tom, letting him know that it was okay to lie. Tom went with it, and he was tested a second time, asked again if he had killed Camille. He said no, and he passed the polygraph test, whereas the first time, he was deceitful. That day, they let him out of jail, and they arrested his brother and charged him with first-degree murder and kidnapping. Floyd was going through a divorce at the time with Heidi, so they used that as the motive for murder. And in order to get a good case, the prosecution held all of the evidence pointing to Tom. And what would that evidence be? Well, let's see. He has a history of making sexual advances to Camille. The prosecution withheld statements from the polygraph. Remember, I told you he admitted to it in front of the polygraph tester. They slid that under the rug. They didn't test the DNA that they found in the case. When they had swabbed for sexual assault, they did have semen, but they never tested it. His father falsified statements to give him an alibi. That wasn't in the case. So, I mean, as if that's not enough. Anything that pointed to Tom, they took out and withheld. And they pretty much nailed Floyd for the case. I don't really know how they did it because they had nothing pointing to Floyd. The only thing that the prosecution had was Tom's testimony. While they were out on the street passing missing persons flyers, Floyd had admitted to Tom that he had murdered Camille and told Tom exactly how he did it. Here's the problem. Remember when I told you that Tom was hard of hearing and he had to lip read? There's no way he would have been able to hear him. But Floyd's defense lawyer didn't say anything about it. And that probably would have been one of the biggest keys to get Floyd out of going to jail. Once this plan was hatched with Mr. Hayes and the police department, Floyd was not getting out of it. I don't even know how the jury even convicted this guy. I mean, there was just nothing. I don't really have the case transcript, so I can't really say for sure. But, I mean, ugh. I mean, like in the Norfolk 4 case, they were talking about how he had confessed to the crime and this, that, and the other. And I really only wish that I had, like, the court case so that I could read it. And But still, they had nothing. They had nothing. They had nothing. And it's so frustrating. And, you know, when you have, like, a bird's eye view of these cases, you kind of just wonder how it all could have went wrong. And the key to this whole thing was the lawyer and the jury. And both of them got played. Ah, this is so frustrating. So anyway, as we all know, he's exonerated. So Floyd was convicted for the murder of Camille and was sentenced to life in prison plus 14 years. Like anybody else who's convicted, he filed his appeals up to the higher courts and he had filed a federal petition for a habeas corpus in 2008. And the district court judge granted it on the ground that that Floyd's lawyer was garbage, pretty much and provided him an inadequate defense. And he was released on bond, and the prosecution appealed, kind of like what is going on with Adnan Syed. It's kind of the same thing, except, I mean, he didn't really get a habeas corpus deal, but still, the prosecution had the opportunity to go ahead and fight back, so they did. And a year later, the Tenth Circuit Court reversed the decision and reinstated Floyd's conviction and sentence, so he went back to jail. Well, there was a little angel on Floyd's side in this whole thing. His savior was out there, and her name is Katie Smith. She was going to school for law and saw Floyd's case and held on to it, knowing that the case was just all wrong. There was prosecutorial misconduct 
ineffective assistance of counsel, an inadequate investigation, which, I mean, they did have an adequate investigation, they just pinned it on the wrong guy. And we all know why, which is garbage. Something was calling Katie to this case, and she decided to see it through. She didn't let it go, and she stayed with it. She went through this case day and night, went through every single piece of evidence, knowing that there was something, something that was wrong with this case or in something that was going to get him out of jail. She spent hours looking over the evidence in the case files, and she knew that DNA would be the thing to solve the case to get Floyd out of jail. She couldn't grasp how anybody would have convicted Floyd when Tom confessed to the crime. There was a confession there. I mean, that's like gold. Not a lot of people really admit to it, but she found it fishy. I probably would have found it fishy too, and I probably would have held on just as much as she did. She knew the DNA was the way to get out of this case, and I don't know how she came up with this idea, and I don't know what popped into her head other than like a miracle. She had thought that Tom's dad had helped Tom drag Camille to the place where she was buried. The only problem was money. If she had enough money to fund a DNA test for Camille's clothes to find DNA on the bottom, like where her ankles were, on her clothes to find um, DNA evidence from Tom's father's skin and test the semen swab for Tom, seeing that if it was, you know, Tom semen and that, you know, considering that he had a crush on her and he had said stuff about her. And it seemed very likely that his semen would be the one that was found in the rape kit. Well, another miracle came through because the Midwest Innocence Project, which is the bigger Innocence Project, had donated her school's program, Project for Innocence, a grant, and the DNA was tested. In September of 2015, the DNA test had come back and it proved Katie's theory. I mean, this chick is smart. It proved her theory that Tom's father had assisted with the burial of Camille and Tom's DNA was on the vaginal swab. Tom had been following the story in the news and he had known that once the DNA came back, he'd be implicated in the murder. The depression was real for him because he was coerced and then went along with framing his brother and it ultimately got the best of him. In November of 2015, Tom had taken his own life and he had left two suicide letters behind, one for the police and one for his family. In those letters, he admitted to killing Camille and how it all went down, in addition to apologizing for doing this to his family. On December 8, 2015, with the DNA evidence and the confession that was written by Tom, a trial was held, and three hours later, Floyd was released from prison with all charges dismissed. He is now considered an innocent man. This case had everything wrong, and it shows how slippery that slope is when you carry all the power, meaning all the power laid with the prosecution and that sheriff's department, and they cut a deal that cost this guy 15 years of his life. They had somebody that admitted to the murder. He was the bad guy. They had the bad guy. Completely, 100% said that it was him, and when he lied about it, he felt guilty about it and still confessed to the murder, and they let the bad guy go which is absolutely disappointing to me because this is not what our criminal justice system is supposed to be about, which is why I like talking about these cases because sometimes and most of the time, police get it right and very little of the times, and I don't care how little it is, people should not be in jail who do not need to be in jail. And this baloney with you owe me a favor because I helped you with your money issues, so we're going to get him out of jail and frame this person, baloney. Kaka. Dumb. Ugh. Anyway, it's just too easy to do the right thing. And it's really, really frustrating when I, you know, look up stories like this. And I'm really happy that this guy got out of jail. But at the same time, it never should have happened because they legit had their guy from day one. He admitted to it two days later. Absolutely disappointing. But Floyd is out. He got restitution. He's talking about um, his experience and everything that happened, and he's trying his hardest to not get this to happen again. And I hope that with these stories, you can go ahead and try to advocate the same thing. And if you see something fishy, call it out. And I mean, man, this chick Katie is amazing. Her theory was the theory that worked, and it, it shouldn't have even had to come to that. But I'm glad that her mind got this guy free. Anyway, That's all I have for Floyd. 
Next week, I begin my Family Annihilator series. I don't really know how many it's going to be because I have like five or six of them, and some of these are very short for the lack of information. I mean, guy went in, murdered his family, and then he murdered himself. There, there really wasn't much to them. So next week's is going to be on two guys. There isn't really too much going on there in the case. Um, and I'll share my research because I've been researching why this happens, what a typical MO is, you know, kind of stuff like that so that you guys can learn something new. All right. Until next week again, sorry for the late episode. Hey, I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to the show. And if you love the show, please leave a review on iTunes and it would be even better if you shared it with your friends and got the word out. Until next time. Bye.